the Main Street with the following condition. The applicant shall obtain all required city of law permits. All construction equipment must access the property through the driveway located in the rear of the building. And last, the applicant shall comply with all applicable local, state, and federal law and regulation in the development of the property. That concludes the reading of the file, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Hearing and seeing none, I will open the pub. Whoops, I'm sorry. You want to ask your? Do you want to ask your questions of yeah, staff? Yeah, I want to ask a question. Could you turn your microphone, please. Was uh, the Bethesda management Tilford Jones Company uh, the one? He's the person that owns those apartments there. Were they contacted? Was a letter sent to them about this using that alley back there that I believe belongs to them? Where the construction equipment is going to use? Well, the owner in this state, the owner had sent the. Um, Contingent letters to the various property. He can come up and ask. Okay. Again. We have the applicant. Welcome. Could you come up and state your name? Yes, my name is Rick Lesser. Hello, my name is Rick Lesser. I'm employed by Nonstop LLC, and the owner of the project is JS1. Uh, we did send the letters out to everyone that was on the list, and I believe the list was made up of all the contingent property owners to the site. And I'm looking at the map just before we started, and it appears that that alley is an extension of Tolson Alley, which is goes all the way from Fifth Washington across Fourth uh, Street, Fifth Street. Um, it dead ends at the apartments, but the access to the apartments is from uh, Wash is from Main Street a little further past our, our property. So uh, that is a in, it's the the use that would appear to us it's in use for access to the back of those buildings. So so I think John's question is: Will your construction vehicles be using? The apartment's property to access, no, or not at all. We'd be coming off of Tolson, which is accessed off of Fourth Street. Over here you, if you have the ability, could you call it up on Google Maps? I don't know that. He, I've got it on Google Maps here. And I think Fred That's was also looking at it there. At the alley, is that a way or private? Well, they told me the city doesn't own it. We could probably get back to Google Maps. So the question, the question is, is that city right away or, or private land? I, I, I don't know. Yeah, we there it is. There you go. It seems to be an extension of Tolson Avenue. Is Tolson Avenue a city road? Arts. Tolson cuts off at Avondale. Avondale, right. yeah. That's what it is. It cuts off at Avondale. But, but it, it doesn't it, come across. It may have gone on across many years ago. Yeah, well, and that's what he's saying. Just that piece right there, it's not what goes through the apartment. It's not, it's not named. There's no streets. Okay. So what that's do you what want? I'm saying. So I just want to find out if the city owns it or who owns it. From my knowledge, I believe the city owns that alley. It, pardon me? From my knowledge, I believe the city owns that alley of the portion. They do. From my knowledge. Okay. Thank you. That's also just as I may interject, that's one of the reasons why Public Works said in their conditions or their comments that the applicant shall contact the department prior to the start of any work. And then it goes on to say the applicant is responsible for all the damage within the public right away. And then it has another paragraph. Does that work too? Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions for the applicant? Thank you very much. Is there anything that you wanted to state? Uh, I, I would say that the amount of work that's going to be involved in just screwing up that portion of the building is not going to be great. Okay. We've only got maybe 20 lineal feet of footing to pour, and everything else can be brought in on pickup trucks. So it's not going to be like heavy machinery, caterpillars, or you know anything like that going on. Thank it's you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I would like to open the public hearing on this application at 
711, I have no one else signed up. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this agenda item? Hearing and seeing no one, I will close the public hearing at 711 p.m. And if there are no further questions from staff, I will entertain a motion. You'll turn your microphone on, please. Um, motion to approve the amended site and landscape application for 407 Main Street, Lower Maryland 20707. Including the resolution number on the agenda. Including the resolution number 19-07-PC. Do I have a second? I'll second. Ms. Quillen, if you would please call the roll. Ms. Bonner. Yes. Mr. Wilson. I'll, I'll vote yes, and I just want to make a comment. I really appreciated seeing the uh, statement from Public Works about the road cuts. Uh, I think that needs to be in every one. I think we've all saw, you know, it, it's amazing that, that as soon as we get a new road done, right, somebody makes a cut. And the fact that we reserve the right to inspect that and let people know in advance, I think, is, is, is a, just an excellent approach. So I'll vote aye. Mr. Welford? Yes. Mr. Kish? Yes. Chairwoman Bettman? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item four, plat of consolidation application and resolution number 19-08-PC, 312, 313, I'm sorry, 312, 314, Second Street, filed by Muhammad Ismail. Included in this agenda item is a public hearing on the application and final action by the Planning Commission. Monta. Good evening again, Madam Chair and fellow Planning Commission members. Platter consolidation application was filed on May the 7th, 2019 by Muhammad Ishmael to consolidate two parcels into one parcel located at 312 and 314 Second Street, Laurel, Maryland. The two parcels are described as a combination of three lots. Currently, the first parcel is a combination of lot 14 and part of 15. The second parcel is a combination of lot 16 and part of 15. The properties are zoned CG Commercial General. On May 16, 2019, the application and a cover letter asking for comments were sent to the City of Law Department of Public Works. The following responses were received by, from City of Law Department of Public Works. They had no issues with the project. On May 11, 2019, letter explaining the nature of the application and advising of the scheduled public hearings before the City of Laurel Planning Commission was sent by certified mail to all contingent property owners. All return receipts were received. The file contains an affidavit signed by the applicant attesting that a zoning sign has been placed on the subject property, has remained and shall remain till a decision is reached by the City of Laurel Planning Commission. Staff recommend Men's approval for 312 and 314 Second Street plat of consolidation with the following conditions stated in the technical staff report. That concludes the reading of the file, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? I, I Mr. Wilson. So I, I, this is more of a process question. Um, at some point, the applicant's going to come and say, I want to put in a parking lot here. Obviously, they'll have to. Uh, uh, follow whatever rules as far as pervious and impervious surfaces. Yes. But my question is, is do they fall under the new stormwater management rules or will they get grandfathered in? So as an example, they would have to, cons they would have to be able to process all the stormwater mm -hmm. off this lot, right, without letting it leave their property under the new rules. They, if, if this was an existing parking lot. They do have to follow the current guidelines for the stormwater management. And if, if they, they and if they meet the threshold for the five thousand or so forth, but all for everything that's on here, they have to meet the current regulations. They will not be grandfathered in. Okay. So and the applicant is aware of that actually um, the applicant, my staff, and public works have had numerous conversations with them on site and in offices. More than likely, depending on how big the parking lot is, they're going to have to put in some form of holding tank, right? Correct. Which is going to cost some money. So, as long as they sure. understand that, that's great. Thank you. That's yeah, all I have. Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you. Any other questions for staff? I will open the public hearing on this application at 7.16 p.m. I do not have anyone currently signed up for this agenda item. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Hearing and seeing no one, I will close the public hearing at 7.16. If there are no further questions, I will entertain a motion. Madam Chair, I'll move to uh, approve the plan of consolidation uh, application uh, with the stipulations in the uh, file and the resolution number 19-08-PC for 312 314 2nd Street as filed by the applicant. I'll second that, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Quillen, if you would please call the roll. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Kish? Yes. Ms. Bonner? Yes. Mr. Welford? Yes. Chairwoman Bettman? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item five, amended MXT concept plan application number 891 and resolution number 19-03-BC, Van Dusen Road, filed by Strip Matter Land, LLC. This agenda item includes a public hearing on the application and final action by the Planning Commission. Mr. Love. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commission members. The proposed ordinance number 1940 is to revise the conceptual site plan in the MXT zone for the West Side project located off West Side Boulevard and Van Dusen Road. The applicant, Strip Matter Land LLC, is seeking to reduce the retail area to 40,000 square feet maximum and include an additional 81 townhomes on the site. The property was previously approved for 200,000 square feet of commercial space. The current application is revising 16.9 acres of the West Side project with 9.4 acres of proposed new townhomes and 7.5 acres of commercial use. On January 20, 2013, MXC, MXT concept plan was approved for the first 39.87 acres, and then on April 22, 2013, the remaining MXT concept plan approved for 19.89 acres. The West Side project consists of four phases. Uh, this would be the third phase of four. On May 1st and June 4th, representatives from Strip Matter Land LLC met with residents of the West Side Townhomes Homeowners Association to discuss the West Side development project. Topics that were discussed included, but were not limited to, when the retail portion would be developed, what retailers were coming to the development, vehicle access to the community, the types of housing that were being proposed for the community, potential for a community clubhouse, and access to amenities. Staff recommends that the City of Laurel Planning Commission approve the revised conceptual site plan for the West Side property with the following conditions. And there is one additional condition that we had added from the previous time. Um, one, all construction shall conform to this ordinance as well as the final MXT plan as approved by the City of Laurel Planning Commission. Two, the applicant shall obtain final site and landscape plan approval for the proposed townhouse uh, portion of the project from the Planning Commission. Three, the applicant shall obtain preliminary subdivision plan approval for the proposed townhouse portion of the project from the Planning Commission. Four, the applicant shall obtain record plat approval from the Planning Commission for the additional townhouse portion of the site. Five, the applicant shall obtain subdivision, subdivision plan approval for each individual pad site within the proposed commercial area from the Planning Commission if applicable. Six, the applicant shall obtain final site and landscape plan approval for each individual pad site within a proposed commercial area from the Planning Commission if applicable. Uh, this is the addition. The applicant is number seven. The applicant or its designee shall concurrently apply for the building permits for the first retail pad and the residential townhouse units. Eight, the applicant shall comply with all applicable local, state, and federal laws and regulations in the development of the property. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for staff? I have some questions. Um, and if they can't be answered by staff, if Mr. Gibbs, if you would address those when, when you come up, and I'll call. Uh, but um, how many pad sites are there for the retail space? Mr. Gibbs, I think oh. it, I think it depends on how many how much okay. retail actually because I, I I appreciate the added recommendation mm -hmm. about applying for the building permit for the first retail pad and the residential townhouses. So the way I'm reading it is they can 
apply for one resident one retail but all 81 and i think what we heard mr gibbs say to us the last time was if we approve this he can get that retail space in there and he said he could pretty much do that that first so i i if he's available for that or amenable to that i'd like to see possibly that that language clarified just so we don't get one retail pad site and then 81 townhomes and not another retail pad site for quite a bit but mr gibbs if when you come up so does Ma it, Ma do you Chair, understand could, what i'm saying could you clarify that a little more well, please it's my understanding that when you build in retail you 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 have pad sites mm -hmm. so i mean i i don't know the ter correct term i don't know whether the whole like back end if it's a a plaza part if mm -hmm. that's one but then you always see like in the fronts of shopping centers pad sites that yeah. are available so the way i read this recommendation was they have to apply for one retail pad site at the same time they can apply for all 81 of the townhomes and are you looking for them to only apply for say like a stick of townhomes well, or no something i would like just that? i think the i think the commitment to us last time and i'm not sure like i say was that if we go to the smaller retail space, you could get that retail space in there. And that, I mean, so we've got the, yeah, because that's what, I, when it goes to him, we'll have him. But that was the thing that I made the biggest note of last time, because was that you, you had, that's what you had told us. Hey, I can go and get that retail space in there, but I need this approval so that I can, I think we've got the recording, because yeah. I, that, that was the one one absolute takeaway. Okay. Um, are there any qu other questions for staff? Okay. Before I open the public hearing on this application, and I do have several people signed up, I would like to invite the applicant. Mr. Gibbs, thank you. Thank you very much. Good, uh, good evening, Chairwoman Bettman, uh, members uh, of the Planning Commission, and, of course, Council Member Smalls. Uh, Edward Gibbs, an attorney with offices in Largo, uh, representing uh, Strip Matter Land, the uh, owner and uh, developer of Westside. And of course, Mr. Rob Strip Matter uh, is here, as is Mr. Blake Ashrick, uh, his development assistant. And of course, um, Armin Speckle Speckel and Ralph Bell from Roadside, the commercial developers. Um, <clears throat> let me. Uh, let me just directly go to your uh, question. Um, we we have we are in lease negotiations with the pharmacy. There are two pad sites in the front of the retail. Um, we are very close to finalizing lease negotiations with the pharmacy. Um, there is also the potential for a uh, gas station and convenience store on the other ad site in the front. Uh, that is not as far along, uh, but it is moving. The balance uh, of the retail in the back, which were which roadside is trying to make primarily a lot of food offerings, restaurants. Um, we do not, we we do not have negotiated lease terms with anyone, and. Um, and so while we feel, and what I represented, I believe, at the last hearing was that we're certainly going to be able to fill up the 40,000 square feet, but to say we can do that at the time we, you know, we file, file for permits for the residential, no, we, if you heard that, it was certainly a misstatement on our part because that was not our impression. We can't make that commitment, we cannot. What we did was, <clears throat> At the conclusion of our, our public hearing last time, uh, there was uh, discomfort relative to concerns of the West Side Ridge Homeowners Association representatives who were present, the 56 townhomes that have been built within West Side, uh, about the two meetings that we had had. And um, so we went out and we had our first meeting with uh, those folks on May the 1st. Uh, it was a uh, lengthy meeting, number of issues, questions were addressed. Um, during the course of that meeting, we represented 
to the homeowners that we would proffer a condition which said we would concurrently permit the first pad site, meaning the pharmacy, at the same time that we permitted the residential uh, per, uh, project, the 81 townhouse. townhouse. Now, uh, Roadside can address exactly where they are uh, in their negotiations, but, you know, uh, if, if you're going to make the condition, say, all the retail has to be permitted at the same time as the townhomes, we can't do this. We can't do it. Um, there, were, there were a number of other questions raised at the May 1st meeting. Uh, among them, and, and this was a comment made at the public hearing, um, could this maybe be part of these townhomes, if they're going to be there, could they be part of the West Side community, the West Side Ridge townhomes that had already been built? Um, we specified during the May 1st meeting that we had absolutely no problem with that, but that the existing HOA would have covenants, bylaws, and articles of incorporation, which they would have to follow in order to annex this portion of the project into their homeowners association. And, um, but we said we have no problem with that. Can I just ask you to clarify for me, um, just very quickly on that. Mm -hmm. I live in the villages at Wellington, mm -hmm. and that was built over at least 10 years, I think, right? I mean, it was years and years. And um, every, and, and it's not even contiguous. I mean, we're separated, you know, by Bear Branch Creek and all of that. But we are all one homeowners association. Mm -hmm. So why would the existing homeowners association have, am I hearing you that you're saying that the existing one would have to? Annex in the new, the new unit, yes. The, the, their community is called West Side Ridge, and there is a West Side Ridge Homeowners Association Incorporated. Uh, an attorney, Michael Farber, was retained, and he prepared a Declaration of Covenants for just those 56 homes. A Declaration of Covenants for the West Side Ridge Homeowners Association, articles of incorporation to incorporate that entity, and bylaws to generally govern the corporate entity. Um, <clears throat> after our last meet meeting, I contacted Mr. Farber, and I asked him what the process would be. He sent me a copy of the Declaration of Covenants, and truly, I mean, I can put it in the record, but it only applies to those 56 units. It does not apply to anything else in Westside. But if, but if when you came to us mm -hmm. with your MXT, right. and it was for 136 townhomes, wouldn't their covenants have been for the 136 townhomes? We, we didn't originally come in for 136. But uh, you didn't originally come in for these 81 either. That's what I'm saying. What I'm saying. So we're, we're coming into as a, a, a revision. But it's still the second. same property and the same. No, no it's not. Unfortunately, okay. it's not. The, the attorney specifically said there has to be a two-thirds vote affirmatively of the 56 homeowners to bring in the 81 and make them part of the West Side Ridge Homeowners Association. So, uh, so anyhow, we said, look, you know, we're happy to do that. We're happy to you know, make it so that all the amenities in this portion are available to you as well, as long as you uh, undertake whatever is necessary to make that legal. And, uh, and so there was, uh, you know, there, we, and we offered the permitting condition uh, that I just explained and which has been articulated by Mr. Love. Um, so, so then I sent, uh, and one of the questions that the homeowners had was, you know, because they were concerned because they, they said when we bought our units, we were told there was going to be a grocery store. And so there was a question raised as to when we went to the mayor and said, we can't do a grocery store. We can't do 200,000 square feet of retail. And that was one of the questions that they posed. And um, I provided information as to the two dates that we met with the mayor and as to the date that the last townhome was sold in the 56. And the date of the last sale contract of sale for the last townhome was one year before our first meeting with the mayor. So there was no overlap time. Um, 
Anyhow, you know, I, I confirmed our meeting uh, with Mr. Mills, who had been the uh, primary uh, spokesperson for the HOA at our last meeting. Um, and he sent me an email back the same day, I think, called May 8th, saying, you know, we want a clubhouse. And, you know, clubhouses are uh, not something you would typically do for this few uh, homes. Uh, but we went back and went. To the drawing board, so to speak. Uh, my client spoke with uh, some other developers relative to town, uh, to community buildings, and uh, so we asked to have another meeting with the homeowners, and we met with them on I think it was June fourth. Um, we went back, and I, I would say I would say both meetings were extremely cordial, and representatives of the homeowners are here this evening. They can speak for themselves, but I think both meetings were extremely cordial there. Their, uh, Mr. David Thompson of their management company appeared at, was present at the first meeting, not the second. But the primary purpose of the second meeting was to go back and say, you know what, we'll build the community. 1,500 square feet. Um, we prepared a revision to the concept plan that showed them exactly where it would go, where the pavilion was going to go in the Village Green. It would be a 1,500 square foot community building. We gave them a draft floor plan for the building. Uh, and we also gave a list of specifications for what we would include in the building as delivered to them, which would include <clears throat> primarily, you know, a meeting slash party room, furniture, uh, a kitchen fitted out with dishwasher, sinks, uh, um, bathrooms, uh, large screen TV on the wall, two computer workstations. And there are other specifications as well. We gave them a list of those specifications, all of which would be built at my client's expense and turned over to the uh, community at, uh, at an agreed upon time in, in the development process. Um, the only contingency for us to agree to do that was again, that the homeowners uh, make certain that they uh, take the steps that are necessary to annex this portion of the project into their homeowners association with a two thirds vote and to be cognizant of the fact that they needed to prepare an amended budget because there, we don't know how much their dues monthly will increase, but there's gonna be an increase in dues because of maintenance expenses associated with uh, a clubhouse and dog park and uh, uh, tot lot, the things that this section is gonna have that they don't have. Um, <clears throat> we're, certainly willing to proffer that. I've actually drafted, a, I have a draft of a condition. Uh, we're willing to abide by that. Uh, you know, I don't think it's necessary at this point in time in the conceptual site plan, but we're willing to have that added as a condition uh, to this approval uh, tonight. So the citizens can speak for themselves about that. But, you know, again, the only other thing I'd note is, um, you know, we have, my clients have, I think done a great job on everything they've done thus far. They're committed to having uh, an excellent project. And, uh, you know, everyone wishes that we could have had a bigger commercial component than what we do. It's just the world has changed. Um, and, you know, the residential that we're proposing to switch out is permitted as a matter of right. zone. It's not like we're coming in and saying that we have a conditional use. It's permitted as a matter of right. And um, so, we have assured <clears throat> the citizens that if this is approved, next step in the process is going to be the preliminary subdivision plan because there was a concern to make sure that if this is going to happen, the quality of the townhomes to be built is going to be equal or better than the quality of the homes that these folks have, have purchased. My client has made that commitment. NBR, the builder of their 56 units, has a right of first refusal for all 81 of these units. They are very interested. They have not signed a contract. They're very interested. It would be premature. Um, but as I explained to the citizens, as we go down, the next step in the process is a preliminary subdivision plan. That would set out the exact size of the lots. So that would be the first checkpoint. The lots shown on that, on that preliminary subdivision plan would match the size of the lot in their townhomes. And then, of course, the detailed site plan, which is really you know the architecture, the height, the access, the garages, <clears throat> all the extra parking and you know we've pledged to them that we're going to before we file a preliminary plan we're going to go back and meet with them and show them the plan. before we file a detailed site plan we're going to meet with them and show them the plan 
and our commitment is equal or better to what they have. And I know that everyone here will remember that and, and will we'll, uh, expect it and demand it as well you should. Thank you. Mr. Gibbs, how many? <clears throat> so there are two retail pad, pad sites in front of what you called the back. How many retail storefronts in the back? And I know it can differ depending on if, if a restaurant or something came Four in that five. was taken three, but. Why don't we have Mr. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just looking in general it, it's, come up and, uh, to try and get a sense of how big the 40,000 feet. Hello, uh, Armand Spike L with Roadside Development. Welcome. Um, our, what, what we plan is to have the two uh, largest tenants in the front, the and then behind them we have a potential uh, freestanding building for a restaurant oh, that okay. could, or could not be a, a, a pad site, in other words, a separate okay. uh, uh, property. And then we have several buildings that will probably all be uh, within the same site, but the buildings uh, will not be connected because we're keeping uh, space between sections uh, in case we get restaurants, we'll be able to offer outdoor seating. Okay. So we're, we're too far out from the delivery date to really effectively negotiate with the kinds of tenants that we would have in, in, in that section. So our hope is as soon as we can, we're pretty far down the road with one of the tenants, uh, with another tenant that the, that the a lot of the uh, community uh, was anxious to get. Um, is interested and we actually have a lease negotiated, but we have not uh, uh, been able to uh, negotiate the uh, final site plan. So Thank you. That's where we are. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the applicant? Thank, Thank you. you. I would like to open the public hearing on agenda item three. Sorry, at 7.38. I do have several people signed up for this agenda item. Um, Clarice Haslett, Haslett, welcome. Are you okay? Yes. Okay. Before I close the public hearing, if you change your mind, just raise your hand. Vivian Walker, welcome. If you would state your name and address for the record, please. Um, I would just like to say I did attend the previous meeting um, when the community community came forward and said that we had not been invited to the two earlier public meetings um, that we found out were pretty much for the apartments. But these gentlemen have um, reached out numerous times, did come to the um, HOA meeting, spent quite a bit of time going through every issue that we brought up um, and then followed up with the meeting last Tuesday, um, came back and gave us, I think, a preliminary because it looks like they don't have it. So um, a visual of what a revised plan might look like. Um, one of the things that I thought was very, um, it really showed their willingness to work with us is that the first plan that they brought um, forward, the layout was actually flipped, where it really would put um, all of the retail between our existing townhomes and the new ones. And Mr. Mills made a recommendation to try to make this a more cohesive community, and he asked and offered if they would consider flipping it and putting the retail towards Van Dusen, and they have presented that here. And so it may not be in the official record, but we're hoping that this is the, the more updated layout. That, that will come to us next, yeah. right? Okay. right? I was gonna say, what is in front of us is the, it, is, 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 no, 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 oh. no, no, not even that. Mm -hmm. Is we are, what we are approving is the requested change yes. to yes. the mix. So, yeah. so we'll, we'll continue to work with them. And stay sure involved, it looks, yeah, absolutely. It looks this way. And so I really just wanted to give them credit for, um, um, coming out, listening to us, um, being um, flexible and trying to help us be more comfortable um, with the revised plan and what they're going forward with. I think I, speaking for myself, understand that if they are unable to get 
a grocery store and whatever we were promised, uh, you know, it, it may not, it's not their fault. But um, considering the, the new facts of the situation, I think that still having the retail and these new townhomes and the offering of the community center shows that they're willing to work with us and we hope that they are able to continue to be flexible to do so. So we appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Walker. I do not have anyone else signed up. Is there anyone else with, with, wishing to speak on this agenda item? Okay, hearing and seeing no. Mr. Smalls? You saw me move my finger, didn't you? I sure did, <laughs> so I will not close the hearing until I. Last time you did that, something caught fire. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there. Councilman um, Smalls. My, my question is, is to the, to the residents, uh, just in general, regarding <clears throat> the annexation, uh, have you had an opportunity yet to talk with your management company, et cetera, about what you, know, you guys need to do to incorporate the 81 townhomes and, event and also the, uh, uh, the clubhouse into your uh, overall community? Yes, we have. You we just. State, I'm sorry. Oh, you would state your name and address for the record, please. Yes, Clarice Eastlet, and my address is 14311 Ridgeview Lane. We are in the the early stages of speaking with our property manager regarding the budget and the things needed to incorporate the new HOA. Um, from my understanding, that um, we would need to gather those items before we go into a community vote. So we want to make sure we have everything in place. And from what I understand, that vote will be needed prior to the new conceptual, conceptual plan. plan. Mm -hmm. So um, we have time to um, get those items together. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Councilman Smalls. There's no one else wishing to speak. I will close the public hearing at 743. And if there are no further questions for staff, I will entertain a motion. Okay, turn your mic on. I will um, move to approve the amended XMT concept plan application 891, including the staff report and resolution number 19 dash 03-PC Van Dusen Road is filed by the applicant. And let me just say, um, I, I think this was a, a, a great turnout. I applaud the, the residents. You guys had a little bit of leverage and used it. That's a good thing. Uh, I, I really hope that you can get the 56 votes. I guess, is it 56? Two thirds of 56. I mean, I, I you know, part of, the, part of the west side is to try to make that work. I know with the way the roads are and things, it's hard, but you, you want that to be a community. And I think you guys are well on your way to do that. I think in this matter was probably a great stimulus to, to get the community together. I know it's hard in a community where people just moved in, you don't really know each other, you don't have that length of time. So this is you know the first, uh, the first bat, uh, uh, foxhole uh, event. And I think you guys uh, played it uh, brilliantly. <laughs> And I want to thank the developer and, and, and uh, all the folks involved with this. I mean, and you guys have been great. And I vote aye. Oh, I haven't been asked to vote yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was just a That's motion. That's his motion. Do we have a second? <laughs> second. Thank you. Ms. Quillen, if you will please call the roll. Mr. Wilson. i got to say aye now. Ms. Bonner. Yes. Mr. Welford. Yes. Mr. Kish. Yes. Chairwoman Bettman. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And Madam thank Chair, you all. Before you move on, thank I, you. Uh, give me a chance. I just want to echo uh, and add to what uh, Commissioner Wilson said. This is, a, I, I think, a fine example of government, community, and development community all coming together uh, for the common good. Everyone wins. Uh, as this moves forward, and, and I just think it's a, a great testament to that collaboration. Thank you all. Mo moving on to text, uh, no, uh, boy, I'm having tongue tied tonight. Agenda item number six, text amendment number 255, ordinance number 1945, an ordinance to amend 
Chapter 20, Article 1, Division 1, Section 20-1.7, Division 6, Section 20-16.10, and Division 14, Section 20-26.15 of the Laurel Unified Land Development Code to amend the paving requirements for parking areas and access driveways throughout the city and providing an effective date. Application filed by the Mayor and City Council. Mr. Love. Good evening once again, Madam Chair and Commission members. The proposed text amendment 255 ordinance 1945 would amend the paving requirements for parking areas and access driveways throughout the city within the Laurel Unified Land Development Code. The amendment would include a definition for impervious surface, which would be the following. A surface that includes but is not limited to concrete, asphalt, pavers, brick, and all paved and prepared drivable surfaces pursuant to section 20-16.10 of the City of Laurel Unified Land Development Code. Impervious surface will be replacing the list of acceptable materials and will be reviewed by uh, ECD staff. The, the Historic District Commission will review surfaces brought before them as they do now. The main change is that the city will no longer allow gravel as an acceptable surface for parking areas and access driveways if it is proposed to be installed after July 8, 2019. If you have an existing gravel parking area or driveway, you may not make improvements of it with gravel after July 8, 2019. It must be an approved surface as stated in the code that is approved by ECD staff. This is true for those properties in the historic district also. Uh, some of the, the reasons that we're looking to make these changes are First, the impacts of loose gravel, which include damage to vehicles due to spillage onto sidewalks and streets, safety risks to pedestrians due to gravel kickback from vehicles, uh, the clogging of storm water drains, then also the visual maintenance impacts. Uh, gravel driveways and parking pads require more maintenance, and gravel driveways and parking pads can easily fall into disrepair with vegetation growth and bare dirt. It is re recommended that the Planning Commission recommend approval of text amendment number 255 ordinance 1945 to the Mayor and City Council. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for staff? So, I do. Go ahead. Have question. And we have so, questions. we're not saying, we're not disallowing pervious surfaces. Mm -hmm. We're actually, as a city, encouraging pervious surfaces for new construction. So if somebody has a new, they want to put in a pervious surface, mm -hmm. or does, does section 2016.10 apply? It does, but we can, we can certainly clarify that more if you like. Okay, so if I would propose, I mean, I don't have a problem with the definition of an impervious surface. I would say driveways shall improve with an impervious surface, a pervious surface, or other material which the DECD can can determine as acceptable. So just to add, Something. in my opinion, just so we everybody knows that with a um, or a, a, yeah, put in after where pavement is struck out, I would put in or pervious surface or another material which the thing is, and okay. one of the attorneys will have to tell me if those ors <laughs> I, I, I've gotten beat up over that before, ors and commas. <laughs> uh, so the, the intent is we want yeah. the applicant to be able to do both. And I realize you guys don't want to try to write what, what is evolving technology in terms yeah. of pervious surfaces mm -hmm. so that people can just go to you and say, this is what I plan to do. Are we okay? I understand. Well, so I'm thinking, okay, parking areas and driveways shall be improved with an impervious surface or another pervious material, which is a part of economic there you community go. development. Perfect. Determines, okay. And I'll, uh, we can make the change in 20 26 15 too, to put that after the other uh, right. that within the uh, historic okay. district. And then so. this date, just because this is such a new thing, I, I would say is, would it, would it be acceptable to my colleagues to change that from July 8th, 2019? To, to give applicants, say, six months. Again, nobody needs to change anything. This is all for new stuff or if you're going to repair your driveway or mm -hmm. do something like that, right? Yeah. So if you have an existing gravel driveway, you get grandfathered in, right? Yeah, if, you, if you ha you're if you grandfathered into having the driveway, we're not saying that you have to change it. We're saying after that day, you can't change it, like repair it as a gravel driveway. This is saying that at that point, you would well, have to You can to maintain to it, though, as a gravel driveway. You can maintain it as one, but it's it's saying that you can't 
you can't actually repair it as one. It's actually trying to push away from gravel altogether. We're trying to get rid of gravel. So if I have a gravel driveway yes. and the gravel's deteriorating, can I put new gravel down after this effective date? According to this, no. You guys are going to get the phone calls, not me. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that your intent? That's it. That was the intent, yeah. Okay. Do we know, do we know how many gravel driveways are in the city That's and good. the length of it? Well, it's not just strip pad, gravel driveways, it's parking pad. So as an example, I have a gravel parking pad that you wouldn't know there's gravel there, but there's gravel there. So that's correct. I don't have a problem. I don't really need it. It was always there, but there's, there's quite a few in Old Town. There yeah. are. There's so quite a few. I mean, th that, was, that was the intent of this. That it was already, uh, code already did not allow for new gravel to even be put in. That right. was already within the code. Right. This is now just saying that put an end date to that, and especially within the uh, historic district. Put an end to that. So that right now. Okay. I, I would move to, to change the July 8th, 2019 date to make it fe effective 1 January 2020. That would give us approximately right, six months. If, if you guys are all amenable. Just to, and we're, we're going to need some messaging on this so that people know because... Oh, yeah. I mean, right now, if, if I was going to put gravel in my parking pad, I don't know if I'd even come and ask permission. You wouldn't. I would no, just no. go and no. fill up my $50,000 wheelbarrow Ford pickup truck <laughs> and put gravel in. So I think, Rick, it, it's what I'm, I'm getting from you is that in a similar fashion to what the city has been doing to launch awareness for plastic bags and that sort of thing, that the same kind of effort uh, at the appropriate time should be done uh, to make people more aware that uh, this this uh, text amendment is is in place and what the effective if date is. If we're, I I don't have any problem with the reasons we want to move away from gravel. I just yeah. there's mm -hmm. there's gravel driveways and parking pads and a lot of other things and I, I, there's going to be a lot of people uh, yelling yeah. at the council. Well, I was going to say that raises the issue of did we do any kind of, everything before us this evening and we do have people signed up to speak on this i have not not forgotten that let me make sure i i note that but for example in all of the other applications we've had tonight certified letters went to people so that they knew that we were discussing something text amendments are different but is has there been any effort on the city's part to communicate with owners of gravel driveways that we're considering this so that they could either come in and voice their concerns or have, you know, yeah. a request for, for an exemption for a certain amount of time or anything like that. I'm, try, so, I'm just trying to think how Madam that... Chair, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, um, thank you, Christian. No, unfortunately, no, no notifications went out. However, prior to the council taking their final vote, there will be an advertisement in the Prince George's Centennial okay. that states that text men text amendment ordinance is pending and what it's about. Um, and I will go on record also saying that changes to this type of ordinance regarding gravel and impervious surfaces has been discussed among the council and, um, for a few years now. Now we're just finally getting around to addressing it. Thank you very much. So this tonight would not be a final on it. This would be going to the mayor and city council yes. for addition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. Mr. Love, does the ordinance apply to the gravel alleys in town? Not right now, no. They, they don't apply to the alleys. This would just be for the driveways and the parking pads. Thank you. I do have Mr. Dyer signed up. If you would please come forward. Mr. McLaughlin, did you sign up on the side? You're welcome to come up and I will add you to this. Thank you, Mike. So either one of the two of you may approach the mic and state your name and address. Or both. Yes. Well, they're both coming. Hi, I'm Michael McLaughlin, uh, 10138 Street, Laurel, Maryland. And um, thank you for giving the opportunity. I, I had the privilege of serving with Councilman Smalls on the City's Environmental Affairs Committee for a number of years. And I'm presently trying to help start a group called Laurel Friends of the River Patuxent to uh, help support some of the efforts by the city to help educate some of the residents about uh, the river's rich history with the city, its value to the city, and uh, ways that we can help support the city in its effort to be a better steward 
of the river. Um, I'm, I'm here, I would be here regardless of my connection to any of those groups, just because that's my interest. And we put in a pervious driveway coming up almost 10 years now. And I had to go before the, the main council uh, for those that were here uh, to get an exemption to an, an ordinance that was against uh, parking cars on grass because I wanted to use a material permaturf that allowed you to either sod or, or gravel or anything on top of it. So I had visions of, of a parking on a grass driveway. Well, that lasted one season before I had the rutting uh, where the tires were. So now I do have gravel in those, in those areas. So I would, number one, like you to ask you to rethink your gravel prohibition. Uh, if only from the standpoint of any of you have ever seen any of the, uh, the British TV series, Downton Abbey, or any of those where you see the landed uh, estates over there, they all have gravel driveway. And I say, if it's good enough for Lord Grantham, it would be good enough for Laura. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, that's, and also I say, I like Rick, uh, Councilman or, or Commissioner uh, Wilson's uh, recommendations as far as the, the, uh, the text amendment uh, adding pervious, but I, I, thought, I, I think it would also benefit from a definition of pervious. You have a de definition of impervious, but I think to help educate the public, it would be helpful to, for them to know what pervious is, because I think there was some confusion when I first read that text amendment. I was asking, are they talking about impervious or pervious? So I think having a, a separate definition would help. Um, and that's about it, I think. Yeah, so again, we're, I'm here to help support whatever the city's efforts to help uh, reduce that amount of runoff into the river. Thank so, you very much. Thank you. Mr. Dyer. Madam Chair, members of the commission, uh, my name is Michael Dyer, 310 Fourth Street, uh, Laurel, Maryland. And you'll have to excuse me, I've got a little cheat sheet here that my wife gave me, and it's just my memory goes in and out these days, so she wanted me to make sure that I covered all these particular points. Let me get to the last thing first, where she's got a, a uh, therefore, stop erosion by using pervious materials. And um, uh, she pointed out, and uh, I actually heard on the radio, either yesterday or today, that the, uh, that the uh, Anacostia River received an F uh, in terms of water quality that was uh, following a great deal of water management down there, water cleanup down there. The problem has been all the rain and the, and the runoff. Um, she, she said the you know, reason excess, uh, even though they've been working hard to improve water quality on the Anacostia, it received an F. The Patuxent River has received a D minus so far. So we don't know what's going to be uh, the next rating. Um, uh, she points out the washing of trash and chemicals uh, into the river, erosion deposits dirt into the river, mudding the water. Sunlight cannot penetrate for plants to grow that would help clean the water, and therefore stop, uh, stop erosion by using pervious material. So. Uh, she is much more articulate about it than I, uh, plus she is much more intelligent than I. So I am a poor <laughs> second, but... Uh, She's watching, isn't she? No. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you, Mike. So, so Mr. Wilson's addition, I think, of making sure that we're clearly... Every time I go to the library, I think of Councilman Smalls as I drive over that pervious lot um, and and to what you raised about the fact that some of it is new to people when you're putting on a pervious surface it, it might not look to somebody as what they're used to it's not concrete or it's not asphalt mm -hmm. but it could be that it's better for the environment I think so. I know what you're talking like kind of the, almost there's some that almost a honeycomb look to it and I Correct. think I know that's yeah yeah so let me just make sure mm -hmm. So after whatever date this is effective, the mm -hmm. city will not put gravel in the alley. Alleys are not part of this. What's that? I, I just think we're asking people, I, I just think we're going down a path. I get the intent, but we're going down a path where we're telling folks you cannot maintain your 
drive, current driveway and parking pad. Because I didn't realize this when I read it before that this was going to require people to not put gravel down. Mm -hmm. It's kind of unfair to me that we we won't let folks do that on their property, but we're going to put gravel on the alleys because it's inconvenient for us not to put gravel on the alley. That may not necessarily be so, Rick, because we've been discussing the surfaces and uh, maintenance of the surfaces and alleys for a very long time as well. Uh, and gravel has not been one that is uh, very well favored uh, in any of the alleys that the city has any responsibility to, because there are many of them that are Private. jointly owned by the, the property owners that abut these alleys, uh, and they have the responsibility of maintaining them. So there have been long discussions uh, over the past two years, actually, uh, among council regarding exactly how these alleys should be maintained, whether they're city owned or whether they're privately owned. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this text amendment? Okay. Hearing and seeing no one. If there are no further questions, I will entertain a motion. I will move to approve the text amendment with the following changes that, as articulated by staff. Uh, with the change of date to 1 January 2020, and with the uh, uh, staff putting in a definition for pervious, I think that was a great mm -hmm. thing. You know, I don't, I'm sure there's got to be, yeah. you know, one somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? Second. Oh. Thank you. Ms. Quillen, if you would please call the roll. Mr. Wilson? Yep. Ms. Bonner? Yes. Mr. Welford? Yes. Mr. Kish? Yes. Chairwoman Bettman? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to text uh, agenda item seven, text amendment number 254, ordinance number 1944, to amend the City of Laurel's Unified Land Development Code, Chapter 20, Article 1, Division 1, Section 20-1.7, and Division 9, Section 20-20.5 of the Code to allow electric security fences in the Industrial General and Industrial Commercial Services Zones and establishing fence regulations. Application filed by Electric Guard Dog, LLC. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman and fellow commission members. The applicant electric guard dog filed a text amendment application 254, which would permit electric security fences within the industrial general and industrial commercial services zones within the city. Currently, the code does not allow for electric fences to be constructed within the city of Laurel. An electric security fence is defined as a fence intended to guard property against unauthorized entry and to protect stored, go stored goods and products from theft or unauthorized handling. The electric security fence shall not exceed 10 feet in height and shall be sur surrounded by a non-electrical security fence that is at least 5 feet in height. An electric security fence shall comply with the following conditions that are outlined in ordinance number 1944, which include the definition of a fence, electric security fence. An electric security fence shall be permitted on the property in the industrial general and the industrial commercial services zones. Prior to the issuance of a fence or electrical permit, an amended site and landscape plan to include the location, height, design, and style of the fence shall be approved by the Planning Commission. An electric security fence shall not exceed 10 feet in height and shall be surrounded by a non-electrified fence that is at least five feet in height. The building line and yard requirements shall not apply to the electric security fence and the non-electric perimeter fence surrounding the electric security fence shall have a minimum of a one foot setback from the property line and a landscape buffer shall be installed around the non-electric fence. Furthermore, all electric security fence shall install an emergency access device known as a Knox box in the event that emergency services or the City of Laurel Police shall need to access the property. Warning signs in both English and Spanish shall be placed every 10 feet along the perimeter of the electric security fence and shall be maintained in good condition at all times. A fence permit shall be required for both the electrical security and non-electric perimeter fence. An electrical permit shall be required for the fence 
and the voters shall not exceed 12 votes. Prior to filing the application, Electric Guard Dog, known as the applicant, met with city staff multiple times and the council to explain Electric Guard Dog's fences as well as address any concerns. It is recommended that the Planning Commission recommend approval of Text Amendment 254 to the Mayor City Council. Thank you. The presentation that was included in our packet, the elect was an excellent, very, very thorough, very, very informative presentation. Um, my question, Christian, is, and I'm sorry I didn't think of it and call you earlier on it. Okay. My question is just, can you give us some examples of where we actually have these IC so, and ICS zones, an example? Mm -hmm. So um, we're not talking about like at the shopping center around the, the BG&E No, so in reference, where, um, a good example is the SIA 9001 or 9007 Marshall Avenue, the trucking terminal. That's zone IG, and the other areas would be behind the Burger King on Route 1, which is IG or ICS, and then the other area is only um, Bray Green Road, that small portion. Okay, so these aren't things that are up against a residential or no, or schools or anything else no. like that. And I understand there's the five foot non-electrical and all mm. of that. It, very, very informative. But I just couldn't think of where we had the I, IG. Right. Thank you. Are there any other questions for staff? I don't know if it's uh, for staff or the applicant if they're here. Um, but on the Knox box, when, when that is used, does that also turn off the current to the fence, or is that the Knox box just to open the gate? I believe it turns off the current and it opens the gate, but the applicant okay. can address it if necessary. If you would... Well, I, I, get, I have a couple please of questions. Approach. Do you want for the for, for staff? For staff? Okay. So how, okay. 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 If you'll just wait, if you'll just wait a few moments. Bill, don't lose your question, okay. and we'll ask staff questions, and then we'll bring the applicant up. Thank you. So this is another process question. I apologize. No problem. This is being brought by, this applicant is not, we don't have a, a, a property owner in town that's applied. Currently, we do not. Right. And so do we have, stand, do they have standing to make an application? They're not a property owner. They are not a property owner. However, they do have standing because if, and I don't want to speak out turn, I know they have been in conversations with someone who would like to possibly well, put up one. I get that. Well, that person can come in. And, I'm just saying we're going down a slippery slope here, and I don't have anything against your product, but what company, we could have a lot of companies that could come in and do text amendments. Mr. Wilson, where, where do you draw the line? Uh, yeah, if I can just speak to that. A text amendment is legislation. It's, it's, it's generated by the city. It may be generated because of a request by, an by a person, by a corporation, by whoever it is that might raise an issue that could justify legislation. Yeah. But there's really not technically an applicant. So this is something that the, was brought to the attention of the city. The city staff reviewed it determined and the city council has been reviewed it and determined that this is worthy of attention. Uh, they drafted the legislation and it's before you. It applies to whatever uh, party meets the requirements or meets the, the, uh, uh, the standards of the legislation. So there really is not an applicant per se. Once this is approved, then uh, any party can come in and apply for the the fence as I'm, noted. I'm fine with you there. What, what, I'm, what I'm, a, I'm, I'm a little worried about is there's lots of products. Some of them probably aren't in our code, but as long as, so the, 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 the term applicant doesn't apply to these folks. Correct. They're just, they, they have a product and there may be somebody that wants to use it. But text amendments frighten me because they're applied everywhere without, without regard. And, 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 we don't, we, we're not soliciting input from property owners. Well, what you have is you can see you have certain criteria within the legislation. And anyone that meets those criteria, that's correct, can come in and seek to, uh, to take advantage of that particular amendment, whatever that is. I understand what happens after we approve it. But what I'm saying is this body has, has some say in text amendments. Correct. And, and to me, text amendments are the most blunt force instrument that we have in planning and zoning. 
short of a master plan because it gets applied everywhere and there's we haven't gone out and told people in the CS zones and the ICS zones oh by the way we're going to allow electric fences that may be the case however if someone an applicant wanted to put up an electric fence they would have to come before the planning commission and all the contiguous property owners will be notified prior to the planning commission about the process of someone yeah, but by then up. it's allowed by right only if it's approved by the planning commission right. they have to come to the planning commission to put up every electric fence and they would have an uh, property owners would have Adjacent property owners would have we'll be to be notified. Apply. So it's done by special exception. No, it's done by a minute site and landscape plan application. So it comes to the planning commission because they want to put up, they're changing their property. It's a commercial or industrial property. They're changing it. So they have to come to the, they have to follow a minute site and landscape plan application with the department. Staff reviews it, prepares a staff report with the recommendation. This body will hear it and either approve or deny it. And, and we would solicit adjacent. Correct. Adjacent property owners would be notified about the application. Okay. All right. Okay. So, and thank you. But in clarifying Rick's point, what may have have gotten us all, in all of our other items tonight under general information, the first thing is applicant. On this one, the general information is requested. So I was going by this. But the agenda, if you read the agenda, the last line of the agenda says application filed by Electric Dar Guard Dog LLC. So maybe that needs to be stricken before we would approve. And the reason I say that is if this text amendment is approved, I would assume there are other electric fence companies that then can go knocking on the doors of, of the IG. Um, businesses to to offer their services and then those services would would make a business decision of what company they would be coming right it's similar to anyone that wants to use a certain fence Correct. company they would choose which one that they want to install it they will file their ASL with our department we will present the information to you you determine based on the ordinance if it should be allowed or not so so just to follow up if you allow me this is not part of our record no, it is part of the record. Aren't we, aren't we implicitly uh, endorsing it by making that? No, it was provided as part of the record to give you more background information. Get that. Mm -hmm. but <coughs> you've got this text amendment. You've got this. Somebody comes in and says, oh, I'm thinking about doing an electric fence. And we go, here you go. I don't have anything against these guys. I think it's brilliant marketing, by the way. But I don't know if we in the city ought to be in the business of handing this out. Mr. Wilson. Well, we're not handing them out. That's only for this application. That's not going to be a part record. of it. Well, if someone wanted to come in and see it, yeah, it's public record, but it's not going to be attached to an amended site and landscape plan application. This is what they submitted when they spoke with the council right. regarding it. Okay. So. Mr. Wilson, at the end of this process, this just becomes legislation becomes part of the city code. There's nothing in there about the applicant, nothing in there with regard to the backup material. It's simply descriptive for the purpose of helping the planning commission helping the city council to understand exactly what the legislation is proposing but once it goes into the code there's nothing else that goes into really regard like that. so thank you i appreciate it thank you uh, i'd like to welcome the applicant please applicant. oh no not the applicant <laughs> i'd like to, to that's that's right and welcome if you'd state your name and address yeah, and then the record, i think Dan we Lynch of law firm mac mahosey with offices in green valley maryland here on behalf Electric Guard Dog. Um, electric Guard Dog is actually taking a very proactive uh, approach to this. Um, Laurel, we uh, we have met with the city um, council, met with staff. We also have been to Prince George's County. We've been to Anne Arundel County, and we're just going throughout the state. And I'm only working on stuff in Maryland. Uh, Cindy Williams, who's with me here tonight, um, has been to other jurisdictions. And this is just a, a, a technology that they are trying to, you know, obviously sell uh, throughout the country. And with each state, with each jurisdiction, there are certain changes that need to be made uh, to their local ordinance. Um, for instance, in Prince George's County, the major issue we have there is that the electric fence is allowed, but you have to meet the setback requirements, which means you have to set it back 10 to 20 feet off the property line, which kind of defeats the purpose of having the electric fence. Um, so again, in each jurisdiction, we're just trying to figure out exactly how we can get the thing done. Now, 
this is not just, for example, an electric fence. That's yeah, that's what it's called, but it's electrified security system. Um, the electric fence, which is part of the security system, is a very, very low voltage fence. Um, Ms. Williams can testify to the fact that she's asked to touch it here, um, just to demonstrate that it's really not harmful. Um, it's more a perception issue. People see the sign electric fence, suddenly they're like, I better not go there. But also, if that current is in any, in any way broke, for instance, someone tries to cut through the wires, then an alarm is set off and um, the local are notified. So it's not just the electric fence as part of the system, it's also the fact that it acts as a security system. So again, um, yes, um, presently we don't have, we are working with folks in law, but we don't have anything that's site specific um, for this. We anticipate once this legislation is, and if approved, we'll be moving forward with an application. Um, but again, we're just doing this not just in the city of Laurel, we're doing it in Prince George's County, we're doing it in Howard County, we're doing it in um, Baltimore. Um, so we're going throughout the entire state to address what we consider to be you know, a technology that currently isn't addressed in each local order. We're willing to have a product that a lot of our clients are very, very effective. Um, and we'd like to see whether we can get control of them and allow this to occur. Um, I'm here to answer any questions this board has. Cindy Williams with Black Barb Dog is also here to answer any questions you may have. Um, I do thank you for your time and giving us time for this board. And again, thanking staff for working with us on this today. Thank, thank you. you. If you, Mr. Welford, if you would come back with the, your question. I was curious if the Knox box only opens the gate or if it also shuts off the power. Actually, the Knox box is just to de-energize the fence. It's actually a Knox switch, and it's installed just to turn the power off to the energizer so that the, we don't really affect the opening of the gate. It opens tomorrow the same way it opens today. So if, if they have a manual fence, you still have a manual fence. If they have a motorized fence, it's still a motorized fence. We don't impact the opening, but this Knox switch is like an additional sw Knox switch, I guess, that is um, ordered through fire departments that just cuts the power to the energizer so it does de-energize the fence. But does not really affect the opening of the gate. That's handled however it's handled already. Thank you. Is there a reason for the, uh, to be, for emergency services to be able to turn that fence off? Peace of mind. We don't want to slow down a first responder. The fence, as, as Dan said, I took. I'd like to. Um, but the last thing we want is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Any other questions for staff? Thank you very much. If there's none, I will entertain a motion. A motion. We need to fill up this. Item seven. This one. Protect them. Uh, personally, I, I I don't feel comfortable making a motion to sell something. This uh, kind of scares me a little bit. But uh, I, I agree with Mr. Welfare. I, I would like to know more about it uh, before I was. I, I think we're way out in front of our steering on this, personally. 
I, I, we don't have an applicant. We don't have a, somebody from the city, that, a, a, a property owner that's saying, I want to buy this. Uh, we don't know what other cities do. I, I don't know if the county setback requirement is a good thing. I got a five foot fence here, but I don't understand what the, what's the thing between the fence. And then I just got testimony that says I can touch the fence. So if I'm a bad guy, what are we doing here? So I, I'm not comfortable moving forward on this. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to leave this up to our colleagues, but I think we're way out in front of our headlights on this. You could. Um, do I get this? Hold on for one second. They're fixing the batteries. Um, where do I start with, with this? It, it, it is a, it's a very safe, very effective system for the right businesses. Think trucking terminals, think landscape businesses, people that use outside store, that have outside storage, like a SIA, like an Old Dominion, like a FedEx, very large customers of ours. There has definitely been interest by these customers in SIA, but we were not able to move forward with contract because the code did not allow it. So we had to come to get the code correct before we could sign the contract. That's why we say the contract is not there, but they're waiting on the code. They have even come, um, some of these customers have even come and met with staff and requested this too. The reason I'm here is because we are the technical knowledge on the fence for any questions that you might have about that. And um, it's the text amendment is not site specific, so it would not be appropriate probably for one of those businesses to come before you to request a text amendment that's citywide. For these businesses, the other thing, one of the services that our company provides is the compliance work. We pay for the text amendments. We pay for any legal advice like that to get the language such that, that they can sign a contract with us. It's not their responsibility to do that. We take that on. So that's why you're hearing more electric guard dog side than you are one of these other businesses in your, in your city that has certainly expressed interest. Um, the reason it works is because you post signs that say warning electric fence. You don't post a sign that say warning this is a battery powered fence, this fence won't hurt you. You post a sign that says warning electric fence. We have almost 5,000 fences. Our company alone has 5,000 fences across the country with businesses such as the ones I've named, big name businesses, that would not put their um, reputation on the line were they not positive that it worked and that it was effective and that it was safe. Um, these customers tell us it's a peace of mind for me once I install this fence, I can sleep at night because my crime drops to zero. From reading broken into every weekend to getting to drop to zero. And so we have many national, especially trucking terminals, that use this fence as a go-to, a, pro a proactive measure when they're building terminals to prevent something proactively. But we, again, we don't advertise that it's a safe fence. The bad guys just see electric fence and they say, hmm, not gonna do it. And if they do touch it and break that circuit, as Mr. Lynch says, it really is, a, is, a, is an alarm system. It sets off an audible alarm just like anything, that you're, like an ADT in your home would or your car. It actually places a call monitored 24-7. Um, it actually caused the businessman, the business to verify the alarm before, you know, reaching out to the, the first, you know, the, the police department. Um, I don't know what else your question, what your other questions were, but I'm happy to speak to any, anything you have for the question. Thank you. I Let me ask Councilman Smalls. Yeah, this has been there. discussed with Council. Um, I, um, as, as the chair cannot make a motion, I guess I could step down but, uh, um, or pass it off. But 
my biggest question coming in was where the IC is, because again, I, I'm very much supportive of it and the technology and the, the, you know, lowering the crime around, we have just approved some pretty large industrial things within here with SIA coming in and things like that. So if it's, if it's meeting a need of our businesses, I understand where Mr. Wilson's coming from that, and I think it's unfortunate maybe that we had the application put, you know, in here and how that is. Um, but I know you've met with council, right? They've met with council. And um, can you shed any light on this that might help the commissioners, it, us to at least get a motion whether we're going to vote up or down, but um, sure. let, thank let you. Let me first um, talk about text amendment. Text amendment is nothing new to the Planning Commission. We, we uh, see text amendments fairly often. The council uh, sees text amendments fairly often. And in my experience on the council, those text amendments are not generally associated with an applicant. They're, they're a, a concept that the city wants to get I'll just say for lack of a better word, on the books, uh, so that when a potential applicant comes before us, it's already part of our, our laws. We've seen it, for example, uh, and staff here can correct me if I'm wrong, with billboards. We, we recently had a text amendment that changed uh, to the kind of scrolling billboards we have from the static billboards that we're all accustomed to over the years. There's no applicant, but that concept was something that was approved by this board for recommendation to, or this commission for recommendation to the council and let's move forward. Uh, now that opens it up for applicants, in this case with the electric fences, uh, for electric guard dog, but any other, as uh, Commissioner Wilson mentioned, any other applicant who wants to then come forward. Uh, we don't know what kind of uses uh, may require this kind of, of, of fencing, this kind of, of service, but we want to be out in front of it when that does happen. I'm not opposed to, to electric fences. I just, is there a way to do this as a special exception? I don't want to have something that says we're going to approve every every electric fence application. I just don't think we need that. I I agree with a trucking company down there at the old roadway. If they wanted to come in by special exception and say we would like to do this, your current code doesn't allow it. And but if I put it in the text amendment, when we decide to deny one, we're going to end up in court. Because it's in effect, we've been here. Can we get mm -hmm. can we get an answer to to Mr. Wilson's question and and to to clarify to at least from my point to clarify one of the things he said. An example was given to us tonight when Mr. Gibbs very clearly stated to us, "I have a right to put this here because it it's in there." So um, so to your point, once we approve this text amendment, yes, they would come to us. But you would be telling us the same thing. If you deny it, it's their right, and they're going to come back. So, um, so can we, in the text amendment, say that this use would be an approved, uh, um, an authorized on a special exception basis? So, for example, to my point, if one of the questions came and it was one of the properties that's up against, um, you know, the railroad track and, and, you know, all of that, this body would feel a little bit different than, again, the one close to Burger King where the kids are all running around. And again, I don't know that that one's so, not because. It's so unfortunately, um, what they're proposing is not a use, like it's not a use being as a business. They're, they're proposing, they're proposing to amend the code. However, when an applicant comes back, they're proposing to amend their site by adding a fence. And I would just go on record and saying most of the type of uses that are in the ICS and the IG general zone are businesses where it's either 
not re mostly retail, but auto type uses, trucking facilities, a lot of shipping, heavy, more industrial type uses. We do have another industrial zone in the city, which is the IRTP, which focuses on research and technology. And we excluded that from this because the use, the not the use, but adding an electric fence just doesn't make sense. So we propose to have it in the industrial general and the ICS zone, which are zones that have heavy duty uses or businesses that will probably need this type, such can as we get, I'm sorry. No, no I, well, I was just going to say, can, can we just get, well, I guess the legal opinion, can we add can we do the this two words, I believe, so. that says we want to amend the city, all of these things of the code to allow, add three words, by special exception, electric security fences in the industrial IG. What that would then allow is an applicant to come, you to go to someone and say by special exception, then it is incumbent upon the applicant, which it ultimately is the business has to come to the city, even if it were not by special exception. And I think you're hearing from us what, you know, again, we're, can those three words be added? I'm sorry, let me be short. Um, Madam Chair, I would say no, you cannot, because a special exception is a type of use. It's it's a special type of a permitted use, for which which requires certain process and all of that to go through due to obtain the approval of that. But we're not, as as Christian indicated, this is not a use, and therefore that concept of a special exception does not apply in this case. A fence is a type of a device for which there are certain regulations in the code and this is proposing to add additional regulations for this type of fence but it's not a use per se so, so that so, would not apply so i'm with you what i'm trying to get away from is the text amendment okay and I, 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 you remember my problem with barbed wire from when i was on the city council okay so i still have my plaque with the barbed wire around it um i voted against that um is the if if s what was it s a a i a, I -A as the property owner down there came and said, we want to put this fence there, would they have a mechanism, not with this text amendment, to come to us and ask for an exception to put that fence in? Is there a, is there a path for them to get to this fence if they came? Forward? The only way they would be able to do that is by filing a text amendment. They have to file, there's no way they can say, we just want this for our property. No, because it's not allowed in the code. Is it, is it prohibited? Is it, it's prohibited in the code. Yeah, it's prohibited in the code from section. I don't have you it. can't do electric fences. Yeah, no electric fences are allowed, and it's in the area where it talks about barbed wire. That's the section we amended, but mm -hmm. electric fences aren't provided in the code anywhere. It's not provi It's not prohibited. It's, it's not allowed. If it's not provided for in the code, it's mean it's so not allowed. So there's no way for a property owner to come in and say, I need a waiver. No, they would have to file a text amendment to have it entered into the code. And then the text amendment applies to the entire zone that it's applied to to those certain zones however i stated before they would have to go through the minute site and landscape plan process okay to get approval so so all right i'm past the text amendment i got okay. a couple other issues what's there's this five foot fence that has to be in front of the electric fence it has to be a minimum of five feet but how far from the electric fence in other words are these two fences yes. they they are usually installed about a foot, two feet apart. Not not quite two feet, but about. But it's, so we they don't want too much distance between the two. I understand they they're giving up property, right? Yeah, but you don't want you don't want like a dead zone. And like the dead. purpose for that extra safety. fence is safety, so That's some kid right. doesn't grab onto the fence. If you're going to touch the electric fence, you're intentionally going across the first fence to get there. So clearly, you're trying to improve the property. And. And the setback requirement that the county has, have we looked at that and then said that's excessive or we don't have, we're, we're silent on setback? Well, for the fence, the non-electrical fence, which is the fence that would be outside, it has to have a one foot setback, which is consistent of our setback for fences currently now in the event of public works I had to get on the site to do some work in the right of way or on the sidewalk there. However, also if it, might ease a little heartburn um, if an applicant comes with the application we can have them do a statement of justification with the application stating why they need to put up the fence the electric fence if that would help out 
I'm just, I'm just, text amendments are pretty blunt. It's, mm -hmm. And it just, I'm trying to find a way to not make this blunt. I don't, I understand where they want to get to, but I'm, I'm trying to make it so that we don't, we're not doing a blanket approval. Well, I, I will have to say, I don't know the, the number of businesses, but the area that they're limited to, the industrial general and the ICS zones is not that big within the city. There's only a few properties on Bray Green. It's the industrial com commerce center behind Burger King and the Nasaya site. Okay. All right. I can live with it. And again, if there's any further questions, but we'll be happy. It, it's not you guys. I, I get the fence, although we, we looked at a number of different ways to get this done, and this is uh, it. I, I, all right. This isn't about you guys. It's, it's you. about the process. Thank um, you. After further discussion, is there anyone <clears throat> want it, willing to make a motion? Motion to approve text amendment number 256, ordinance number one nine four four to amend the city of Laurel's Unified Land Development Code, Chapter Twenty, Article One, Division One, Section Twenty Dash One Point Seven, and Division Nine, Section Twenty Point I mean Twenty Dash Twenty Point Five. And before before I ask for a second, can I clarify that you stated text amendment number two five four two five four instead of two five six? Correct. Do I have a second? I'll second. Ms. Quillen, if you would please call the roll. Ms. Bonner? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Welford? I'll abstain, please. Mr. Kish? Yes. Chairwoman Bettman? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And thank you all for for your input and thank you all staff also for that. Thank you. Okay, we still have more agenda items. Agenda item A. <laughs> Everybody's packing up. Packing up. Um, I promise no, I'll be quick. Agenda <laughs> item eight: Planning Annual Report and Resolution Number One Nine Dash Zero Nine Dash PC. All right. Good evening again. Good evening. Uh, per state law, the city is required to have an annual report approved by the Planning Commission and submitted to the Maryland Department of Planning by July first each year. For 2018, the city issued 27 new residential permits. The city is not scheduled to complete and submit its jurisdiction's um, five-year mid-cycle comprehensive plan report at this time. There was one text amendment approved in 2018 that changed regulations in the city's unified land development code. The change includes amending Division 5, Section 20-7.8, 20-8.3, and 20-9.5 to allow house of worship churches to be permitted by right in certain commercial, industrial, and office zones. Furthermore, there were no new schools constructed or changes in the water or sewer area for the city. However, there is a water and sewer category change application currently pending with Prince George's County. The city did not, didn't identify any recommendations for improving the planning and development process at this time. However, the Economic and Community Development Department is in the beginning stages of a comprehensive review and update of the Unified Land Development Code. All members of the Planning Commission have completed the education training course required through the land use article. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission approve the 2018 annual report. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? I will entertain a motion. I'll move to approve the planning annual report and resolution number 19-09-PC. Do I have a second? A second. Ms. Quillen? Mr. Welford? Yes. Mr. Kish? Yes. Ms. Bonner? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yep. Chairwoman Button? Yes. Okay. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Thanks for putting up with all that, guys. I appreciate it. I, Thank you. Text, amendment, text amendments frighten me. <laughs>